Hello. Thank you for watching today. Welcome to Church Online. So glad that you're tuned in. My name's Jake. If we haven't met, I'm one of the pastors here. There are a couple things I want you to know about before we get into the passage today with Pastor Gerald. Number one, today, if you're watching this on Sunday, August 7th, we're having church beach night. That means there's there's no program. I'm not planning anything. I'm just saying me and my family are gonna be at Cayucas Beach at 3.30 today uh, and a bunch of other families are going to go hopefully as well so you're invited i hope you come bring your own dinner bring spike fall bring your kids or leave them at home if you want whatever you want to do um, we're going to meet north of the pier where we had church uh, for hume baptisms so come to that um, second thing is next sunday night august 14th at 6 p.m there's a worship night so I really, it'd be so cool if these next couple of weekends, we really close out the summer as a community, as a church together. We go to the beach tonight, next Sunday night, let's gather on this campus and let's just worship our hearts out together. We're gonna spend some special time praying, um, just seeking the presence of God together through singing. So don't miss that next Sunday night at 6 p.m. The third thing we hope you have known about is that a couple weeks ago, we sent a group of high school graduates and a handful of leaders to the Dominican Republic. And they had an incredible trip ministering to kids and families and the community that they were in down there, really through a variety of different vocations and jobs. So they got to work with uh, people who are doing certain kinds of work on the ground. So full-time missionaries who are full-time nurses in that community or full-time civil engineers or full-time teachers, whatever it is. So our kids got to go and say, okay, I'm passionate about exploring this. And they got to work with a full-time missionary nurse who's doing that work on the ground there. And they got to have so much incredible experience. So we got to put together a recap video of that experience and would love for you to check that out. So Felix has severe autism, um, he's nonverbal, but he communicates a lot through his actions and his body, so we're just teaching him a functional way to communicate by using his car, so every time you Before I left for this trip, I was feeling quite anxious and I was a little bit worried about my relationship with God. I felt like it was not where I would want it to be going on to a missions trip. I'm nowhere near like where I want to be in my faith and there's so much room for growth and there's so much like more I want to experience and like grow in my relationship with Christ. What has impacted me on this trip was that the grace of God is all around me and here is just, the gospel doesn't change. It's the same in one place that it isn't in another. Yes, I believe my calling has been clarified on this trip. Um, I'm a speech therapist and so um, coming here and working at Hennessy's, the special education school, has been a perfect fit for me. Um, I love the kids right away. Um, they were just so, had huge smiles on their faces um, and just so loving and so welcoming um, for us and the team. Seeing how the water filters 
that appropriate technologies are building. Um, seeing the approximate wage for the lower class is about 50 to 75 US dollars a month. And those water filters, they're 20 US dollars, I believe. And if you buy the filter now, you're gonna save so much more money in the long run and have sustainable water for, for years to come um, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Media's been a passion, and I will say my view of photography has changed because of a comment Misael made on the first day about capturing God's light, because photography is all about light. And it's changed how I take my photos because I'm not just looking for the cool shot, I'm looking for God's shot. Before going on this trip, I feel like it was hard for me to kind of uh, get out of my comfort zone and maybe, you know, do something that I wouldn't, but now towards the end of this trip, one piece of advice I'd give to someone going on this trip is to get out of your comfort zone. I was at a very low point in my life. I was hitting a breaking point and coming here has kind of honestly shown me that brokenness and it's kind of made my relationship with God even better because I've had to lean on Him more. So when I go home, I will say, I needed this. I needed time with God. And this has definitely been beneficial to me. I felt like I wasn't supposed to come and then like even being here the first day I was like am I really supposed to be here like I was still terrified and then well I know now like even if I don't feel like I'm making an impact I am and he said no just you being here is a light for them and it's gonna make an impact no matter what like you're gonna see it change because just you being here is you being a light. How cool is that? Man, just so encouraging to see our students step out and serve the Lord and serve the world in such a cool way. Now, we're glad you're here. We're still in the book of Matthew, so get ready and enjoy this sermon with Pastor Gerald. Hi, ABC family. Thanks for tuning in again with us this week. My name is Gerald. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Atascadero Bible Church. And this week, we continue to preach our way through the Sermon on the Mount. So I invite you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 7. And we'll continue by picking it up um, at verse 7. And if you remember last week, Jeff taught us on this passage that precedes today's passage on judging not lest we be judged. And I just want to confess to you that I learned something new last week. And it's not because I'd never read that passage before. It's not because I'd never heard it preached before. But there's just something, some, some reason, the Holy Spirit illumined through his servant Jeff the fact that right there in verse 5, that we are first to take the log out of our own eye, right? So this is the log and the speck. Or take the log out of our own eye, and then we will see clearly to remove the speck from our brother's eye. And Jesus did not say, don't touch the speck in your brother's eye. But he's saying, make sure you do it with humility, with gentleness, with mercy. Take the log out of your own eye first. And so in some way, I feel like Jesus now in the Sermon on the Mount, he's turning our attention and he's actually showing us that as God builds his kingdom, as Jesus builds his church, he's got meaningful work for even the citizens of his kingdom to be involved in, in partnership with him. In other words, we can take the log out of our own eye and reach in and help our brother or help our sister with the speck that's in their eye. In other words, we can help one another in our sanctification. 
And it's a process that requires care. It's a process that apparently we need a strong prohibition against judgment on. And today, the question before us is, okay, so Lord, as we partner with you, as you build your church, how do we get the things that we need? Because obviously we need some things. We need some wisdom. We need discernment, right? And we even need some material things. So how do we do that? What do we do to procure the things that we need to partner with you in this work? Now, just a reminder, the mission of ABC Church is this, equipping people to become like Jesus. So that's the goal, right? And that's even what we're talking about when we're talking about removing specks from the eye. We are removing those things from our eye, from our body, from our character, character defects. We're removing those so that we end up looking more like Jesus. And how do we actually do that? So this passage today, Matthew 7, beginning at verse 7, actually unpacks the how and the why of our first ministry value or our core value. So our mission as a church is to equip people to become more like Jesus, and our core values guide us in terms of how we will do that. And our first core value is this, we will become prayerful and spirit-led. We recognize that apart from Christ, we can do nothing, John 15, 5, so that we will abide in him through worship, practice repentance, and seek the direction of the Holy Spirit through prayer. Jesus actually said in John 15, 5, that apart from him, we can do nothing. We are nothing and can accomplish nothing. Let that sink in for a minute. Nothing. If any of you ever watched Veggie Tales as you were growing up, or if you were parents like my age back in the 90s, we were raising kids, we played Veggie Tales. I'm going to quote Larry Boy, who said, Zero, zilch, nada. We can do nothing apart from Christ. So then how, the question for today, how do we acquire the things that we need to do the work that Jesus has for us to do? That's the question that we bring to this morning's text. How do we acquire what we need in order to do the work that Jesus wants us to do? Let's read now, Matthew 7, beginning at verse 7. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Father, these are your words. You have inspired them to be spoken by your son, Jesus. You have inspired the recording of them through your servant, Matthew. You have preserved them by the power of your spirit for thousands of years. And now as we read them, they will only become the words of life to us. And we will only have our hearts motivated to love them and to obey them under the influence of your spirit. So Holy Spirit, come. Fill us afresh and have your way among us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, how do we acquire what we need to do the work that Jesus has for us to do? Ask, it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. That's the answer to our question. So I'm done. Uh, Have a good week and just live it, okay? (laughs) No, there's so much more here. There is so much more that we can learn from this. And if I can please just geek out on grammar a little bit, <laughs> and I know, I in high school and even in college, I really underestimated and underappreciated a- English language in particular and grammar in general. And it wasn't until I was in seminary that I really learned to appreciate grammar and that it actually matters. So what we're talking about here are three verbs, right? Ask, seek, knock. And these verbs all have a tense, they have a voice, they have a mood, and they are spoken to somebody either in first, second, or third person, and singular or plural. That's about as far apart as you can parse a verb. And these are commands. They are present active imperatives spoken in the second person plural. So, to be clear, the word ask is a command. It's a command that is in the present tense, which means we are to ask together and to keep asking. 
It is a action verb that is to keep recurring because of the, the present tense. So the question would be, well, what are we asking for? And a subsequent question will be, well, what do you need in order to part with, partner with Jesus to do the work that he's called you to do? We, we need stuff, right? If we're going to partner with Jesus in building his church, we need stuff. We need maybe even plane tickets to go where he needs us to go. Or we need material things in order to reach people. We need wisdom. We need discernment, right? We have needs if we're going to partner with the king as he builds his church. So it's a present tense verb. We're to ask and keep asking. Uh, the voice is an active one, and that means the subject of the verb is the one doing the action. We are the ones doing the asking. And it's an imperative, which means it's a command. This is not a negotiable thing, take it or leave it. This is Jesus saying, you want to partner with me in my kingdom? You need to ask. You need to seek, and you need to knock. And what's the result? And right there in verse 7, he gives us, if you ask, it will be given to you. And here's where it gets interesting. So we're all to ask together. It's, it's a second person plural verb. But the answer, the, the result is, it will be given to you singularly. And where do we see this in Scripture? Think about James chapter 1, verse 5, where James says, if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God, who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You hear how that simple request for wisdom, God loves to give wisdom generously, and it will be given to him. <clears throat> the second command is to seek, and that too is plural. It's a present active imperative. So it's a command, it's an active and it's in the present tense, meaning we, we are to seek and continue to seek. And we're to seek together. So the command to seek is plural. The question is, what are we seeking? A subsequent question would be, what do we need in order to partner with Jesus as he builds his kingdom? I think we need knowledge of God's will. Like, how does Jesus want to work? Where does he want to work? When does he want me to partner with him in that work? <clears throat> and the result, if we seek him together on this, Jesus says, you will find. And here it's interesting too. The grammar says, the you there is plural. So y'all seek together and you all will find together. You all seek, come together and ask. And it will be given to you as an individual. Come together and seek and you all will seek and find together. And where do we see this in Scripture? We see this in Acts 16. Let me turn there and read that. Now, this is the account <clears throat> of Paul, and he is seeking to advance the gospel in the known world at the time. And so now it's Paul, and it's Silas, and it's Timothy. And beginning in Acts 16, verse 6, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forgiven by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mycenae, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So do you see how these three are seeking God together? They're trying to advance the gospel. The Spirit of God is forbidding them from proclaiming it in certain places. And then the Spirit of God reveals to them where, they, where he wants them to go, and they conclude together the will of God. They were seeking together, and God help them find his will together in community. And that brings us to the third command, which is knock, which is also second person plural. It's a present active imperative. It's a command. So we're to knock and we're to keep knocking. What do we need, again, in order to partner with Jesus in accomplishing the work that he has for us to do? I think we need knowledge of God's will. We need opportunities, right? Like, who, to whom are we to go with this message of the gospel? And when do we go? And how will you let us into those places? And because it's an active, it's, it's a, 
We knock and we keep knocking. And the result, when we knock, it will be opened to you. And that again is in the singular. So we knock together, we all come together and we knock together and the doors will be opened to each one of us as an individual. And where do we see this in scripture? Paul speaks a lot about open doors of opportunity. Consider 1 Corinthians 16. Paul is talking to this church in Corinth about his travel plans. And he says, um, I intend to pass through Macedonia and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing, but I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because a wide door of effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Paul is choosing to stay in Ephesus because God has opened a wide door of opportunity for him. Even though there are many adversaries, Paul didn't see those adversaries as a reason to move on. He saw that as a, he was exactly where God wanted him to be. And he was going to set up camp there and stay because the door of opportunity had been opened by the Holy Spirit. And as he writes his letter to the Colossians in chapter 4, verse 3, he says this, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. So we are knocking on doors, asking God to open them so that we might have opportunity to partner with him in his work. And that's God's simple process. That's the answer to the question, how do we get what we need in order to do the work that Jesus has for us to do? We ask together. We seek him together. And we knock looking for open doors of opportunity together. So how do you think we're doing as a church at obeying this command? Do we come together and ask regularly? Do we seek God corporately together? Do we knock on doors together, opening, looking for open doors of opportunity? I suspect that we tend to undervalue the idea of corporate prayer, which then makes me ask this question, why do we think we underutilize this process that Jesus has just given us in verse seven of praying for what we need? I think there are primarily four reasons that hinder us from praying together in this way. First, I think since most of us have grown up in the USA, we tend to become rugged individualists. For many of us, our, our faith is a private thing and we tend to keep it to ourselves. And when we pray, we tend to pray alone. And Jesus talks about that earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Go into your closet and pray in private and your Father who hears in heaven will reward you. So. It's not a bad thing to pray alone, is what I'm saying. But today's teaching is very clear. Pray together. We become rugged individualists because life is hard in a fallen world, and we can tend to get used to just fighting for the things that we need. In our praying, let me ask this. Do we tend to demand things from God or tell him what we need from him or want him to do? Have you ever spent any time around a toddler? Usually, most of them at some point in the day, depending on how tired they are, they will say, I need my blankie, or I want my food. And they just begin demanding things from the adults around them. And if you're like me, the adult, in that case, I am wanting to give that kid almost anything other than what he's demanding of me at that time. That's just the sinful Gerald welling up in there. But when they look you in the eye and with that sweet little voice say, Pop, Pop, will you please get me my blankie? My heart melts and I just want to run and get him what he asked for, right? And that's really what God is wanting of us. He just wants us to ask for the things that we need. The second thing I think that prevents us from praying in this way is some bad theology. You may have heard it said that the Lord helps those who help themselves. That is found nowhere in scripture and I know it's a lie, but I can just confess before you that I can tend to live my life as though that's actually true from Scripture. I'm a doer. And while I know that the statement's a lie, I can tend to live as though it's truth. I can tend to strike out and help myself. We can tend to also think of God as a miser. Like he, you're going to ask for a bowl of soup and he's going to give you a two spoonfuls. He's just going to give you a little bit. 
But that is not at all consistent with his character. And we even tend to doubt God's ability to deliver on time, right? Almost always the things we're asking him for, we want now. And almost always his timing is different than ours. A question that we might ask ourselves is, do we, do we pray asking God to open doors of opportunity for us and then wait patiently for him to open them? Or do we just get up after praying and start kicking open the doors that we want him to open? third reason that we probably don't pray corporately together as like we should is, is the idea of unanswered prayer. Sometimes we ask for stuff and it just doesn't come about. It just doesn't happen. So then we stop asking because we feel like we need to protect our heart from disappointment. And if I, I won't be disappointed if I just don't ask God to provide these things for me. But I think underlying all of these reasons for why we don't pray is the fourth and what I think is final and the ultimate reason, I think it's pride. We pretty much hate the idea of humbling ourselves and taking on the lowly position of being one who asks, one who seeks, one who knocks, one who's in need. Can you identify with that? Do you like being one who asks for things and seeks and knocks? Listen to James chapter four, verse two. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. It's just, it, it's as simple as that. And the reason we don't ask is because we're prideful. You see, there is an intimate relationship between humility and prayer. And there's a man named E.M. Bounds who has written copious, wonderful words about prayer. And he writes this. He says, Humility is an indispensable requisite of true prayer. It must be an attribute, a characteristic of prayer. Humility must be in the praying character as light is in the sun. Prayer has no beginning, no ending, no being without humility. As a ship is made for the sea, so prayer is made for humility, and so humility is made for prayer. He goes on in the same book. He says, Humility holds in its keeping the very life of prayer. Neither pride nor vanity can pray. Humility is much more than the absence of vanity and pride. It's a positive quality. It's a substantial force that energizes prayer. There is no power in prayer to ascend without it. Let that sink in. Humility is a force that energizes prayer. Our ability to see ourselves as small because we are actually fuels up within us a desire to pray. More than that, humility is the first and last attribute of Christ-like religion and the first and last attribute of Christ-like praying. There is no Christ without humility. There is no praying without humility. If you wish to learn well the art of praying, then learn well the lesson of humility. Again, that's E.M. Bounds. So, friends, if we aspire to have prayer lives tomorrow that are better than they currently are today, we will do well to grow in humility. And so here we are. The king commands us, his process for getting us the things that we need to do the work he has for us to do is to ask, to seek, and to knock. But why? Why should we? What's in it for us if we do these things? Why should we humble ourselves? Why should we submit to this king and to his process? Which brings us up to our second point, which is the king's promise. And we read that in verse 8. So I'm going to turn back again to the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 8 says, For everyone who asks receives, and to the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What a guarantee. The king is assuring us that we will receive, and we will find, and the door will be opened if we will only ask seek and knock. And we see this illustrated so beautifully in Acts chapter 12 again. Again, this is Paul on one of his journeys, and he and Silas find themselves in prison. This is the story. The crowd joined in attacking them, Paul and Silas, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. 
having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and he fastened their feet in the stocks. So there they are, in prison, bound, feet in stocks. Luke continues the narrative. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfettered. Wow. So there they are, in prison, they're praying, they're singing, they're praising God, an earthquake comes, presumably in answer to their prayers, and the doors swing wide open and they literally become free. And now you and I can look ourselves in the, in the eye and say, you know what? Life just doesn't seem to work out that way for me. I can honestly say that I've never had God bust me out of jail. And in fact, beyond that, so much of the time, it feels to me like God just doesn't even hear my prayers. It feels like sometimes I just offer them up into the atmosphere and they evaporate before they ever hit his ears. Which brings up the question, what about unanswered prayer? What do we do there? We even have modern day theologians like Garth Brooks writing songs about it. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayer, right? I mean, you know the song. Unanswered prayer is a common experience for you and for me. People write songs about it. So why? What's the deal with unanswered prayer? Why do sometimes our prayers go unanswered? What are some of the potential reasons for unanswered prayer? I have a few of them. One, I think sometimes we ask with selfish motivation. We, we ask for our own selfish gain. James writes about this in chapter 4, verse 3. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on yourselves. So this isn't a... a a blank check that God is giving us to ask for the material wealth that we all desire to have in our idolatrous hearts. Sometimes our prayers go unanswered because we ask with selfish motivation. Secondly, sometimes unconfessed sin blocks our prayers. You know, we become ignorant to the sinful attitudes of our own hearts. And, and what sin does is it stops up God's ears to our prayers. Listen to what he said to his people way back before Christ came through the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 1, he says, Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. So there, God makes it really clear that the people of Israel had blood on their hands. They had sin that they hadn't confessed with before him, and that made them dirty. And to that he says, I need you to wash yourselves. I need you to become clean because your sin has stopped up my ears to your praying. And we're reminded from 1 John 1, 9 that this, none of us can wash ourselves. We are desperate for the cleansing of Jesus. John writes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the antidote to having our, our prayers not heard by God because of sin is just confession of sin. Taking God at his word and saying, Lord, forgive me for saying this or for doing that or for this sinful, selfish attitude in my heart. Forgive me. And the promise is you will be forgiven and you will be cleansed and God will hear your prayers. Peter even writes about this in his first letter where he says, Husbands, I want you to live with your wives in an understanding way. If you don't, your prayers will be hindered. So there's a way that we husbands can live with our wives that either leads toward God hearing our prayers or leads toward our prayers being hindered. The way we live on earth matters to our prayer life. 
And lastly, sometimes our understanding of ideal timing is just off. God may not be saying no when he doesn't answer your prayer. He most often may be saying, not yet. This isn't my timing. Keep asking, but not yet. So wherever we are in our struggle with unanswered prayer, here's what we need to keep in the forefront of our minds in order to keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. And that is the posture of our God, the posture of our King, which brings us to our third point. And we see this in verses 9 and 10 that say, Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Did you hear what's baked into Jesus' statement there? It's that this prayer is based on a relationship. It's based on a loving, intimate relationship of that of a son asking or making a humble request of his father. The Most High God is indeed king. He is the sovereign ruler over his creation but he regards his citizens in the kingdom as his beloved children. And he sees himself as their father who alone has sole responsibility to provide for them, to provide for you, to provide for me what we need. The Apostle John just never got over this. He writes about this in chapter 3 of his epistle. He says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. We are God's children. Which then raises the question, Is everyone who walks the earth a son? And Paul writes this to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 26. He says, For in Christ Jesus... You are all sons of God through faith. So the answer to that question is, we are children of God on the basis of our faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who God the Father sent to live a perfect life as our substitute, to lay down that life, to make payment for our sins, so that when we trust him, our sin gets imputed to him and his righteousness gets imputed to us. We get adopted into God's family as his sons. So these prayer promises that Jesus is talking about here in the Sermon on the Mount, they are for God's children. They are for the people who have put their faith, hope, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's you, if you are in Christ today, then Jesus said that God is your Father, your heavenly Father. And he's a good Father. And for some of you, the concept of God being your father is clouded by the unhealthy, even evil and vile things that your earthly father has done to you, even in God's name. Sadly, so many of us have had earthly fathers that haven't reflected the true character of the heavenly father. So that when you think about God being your father, you think, If that means God is like my earthly dad, no thanks. I'm not interested in that at all. And to that I say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that that has been your reality. I'm so sorry that there is an ongoing hole in your heart and pain in your soul inflicted on you because of your earthly father. But what you need to know is that that wasn't God's design for fatherhood. God's design for fatherhood is not impacted by the fall or sin in any way. It's God's good idea. And his his idea of fatherhood is one not clouded by sin, not clouded by selfishness, not clouded by his own personal gain, but it is actually one of loving hospitality. God is our Father who stewards the best of his resources in order to meet the deepest of his children's needs. In other words, like Jesus says here, if you ask God for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. If you ask him for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. He's not that kind of God. You ask him, he will give you what you need because he delights in giving good things to his children, which is verse 11. It says, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? 
Note this description that Jesus comes up with is about as generic and about as broad as it could be. Good things, right? He, he's not putting any categories other than, okay, it's a good thing. <laughs> and I want you to realize that God always gives us the best of the good things. Think about it. We know God to be a giving God. Probably the most familiar verse that any of us has ever heard is John 3.16, which goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. God loves the world so much that he gives his Son. Think about this. He, he also gives his Holy Spirit. This passage that we're preaching today is recorded also in Luke chapter 11. And Luke records it, and he brings a little bit of a different twist on this final verse. He says it this way, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? In other words, these good things, the best of the good things, would be for God to give Himself to you. Because along with the Holy Spirit comes all the wisdom and the discernment and the provision that you need in order to do the work that God has for you to do in partnership with Him as He builds His church. God gives himself the best good thing that he can give. So when we pray, church, let's pray for his best. Let's pray for a fresh filling of his spirit, who Jesus promised would guide us into the truth, who will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Let's seek first his kingdom, taking him at his word and trusting that all the other things that we need will be added unto us. So let me ask this, church. What are you asking God for these days? What do you need? What are you seeking? Like what aspect of his will are you seeking to discern right now? And what are you knocking on? What doors of opportunity are you asking him to open? I, I just want you to think that through and put ideas in your mind that you're actually asking him for, seeking and knocking on. And I want us to apply this by praying together corporately. And as we do, so with these things in mind, you bring your things that you're asking for. You bring your things that you're seeking. You bring your doors that you're knocking on. And we pray together about them. And if you'll allow me the artistic license of interpreting the grammar so that it communicates to us in a clear way, Jesus, I think, is saying this, you all ask together, and it will be given to the one in need. You all seek together, and together you all will find. You all knock together, and it will be open to the individual who wants to enter. Let's take him at his word. Let's ask, let's seek, and let's knock. Father, we're, we're, we're coming together here as your children and you know the things that we need. Lord, as a church, we need volunteers. We're asking you to raise up people to, to be kingdom-minded saints who can steward the best of their time and their talents and their treasure for the good of your church, for the glory of your name, so that we might reach the least of these and be a blessing to them. Join you there in that work. Lord, we're seeking your will. We're seeking to discern how it is that you want us to serve and where it is that you want us to serve. And we know that that means we need you to help us to grow in humility, so would you help us with that? And Lord, we're knocking on doors of opportunity. Where is it that you want us to engage our community right here in Atascadero? Where is it and what doors do you want to open so that we have opportunities here in San Luis Obispo County? Lord, what opportunities of partnership do you want us to, to foster and create so that we are partnering with you in every dark corner of your world through our frontline missionary partners? So Lord, we pray for the things that we need in order for us to faithfully do the work that you have called and equipped us to do. So we welcome you to have your way among us. We take you at your promise that those of us who ask will receive, those who seek will find, and those who knock, it will be opened unto us. 
We can't wait to see how you'll provide. We can't wait to see the wisdom you give. We can't wait to see the doors of opportunity open. Would you give us that measure of faith to walk through those doors as they swing open? We pray this together, corporately, as a church, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who commanded these words to us and expects them of us. To the glory of the King, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. Church, we love you, and we need you. We need your partnership. So lean in today. Read and reread this passage. Ask God what it is that he wants of you in order to faithfully apply it. And let's get together and work together to live it out. Have a great week. We love you.